it is my pleasure to introduce the CEO of Yellowbrick, Neil Carson. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you everybody for joining us today. We're going to be having a chat about data warehouse architecture. We're going to talk about some of the things that we've done in the Yellowbrick database that are really, really special to enable it to run best on the latest systems. In particular, we're going to talk about the need for speed in data warehousing, how to make data warehousing go faster, the need for real-time data, how to make your data warehouse deal with data sources that are up to the second and analyze events that are happening in real time without needing two separate systems to do that. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about data warehousing in distributed clouds. Now onto the first subject, the need for speed. We all know that SQL analytics is about moving and processing large amounts of data at the end of the day. This is different from storage systems and networking devices because all they do is they move data from A to B. They don't actually have to process that data and turn that data into information. We have to process the data as well, which is a much harder problem in computer architecture to solve. This has got far harder in the last few years because of the advancements that have happened in the underpinnings of the database, which are data storage, data networking, and data computation. So we're going to look at all of those areas, talk about what's changed and why it makes the problem difficult and how we've solved it. So when we talk about the network, for example, databases take in data from the network or from storage. Massive accelerations have happened in networks over the last decade that are forcing a re-architecture of the data path. A typical network has gone from offering one to two gigabytes a second of bandwidth back in 2010 to offering 10 to 20 gigabytes a second or sometimes more in 2020. That's because common networks have evolved from being 10 gigabit networks to 100, 200, or 400 gigabit networks, over a tenfold improvement in throughput. At the same time, storage systems have gone from being around two gigabytes a second for a typical server connected to a bunch of hard drives through to offering over 24 gigabytes a second today. So all of these problems make it harder and harder to do line rate processing of data at these rates. So I wanted to put those numbers in perspective. Those data rates that we just talked about are the equivalent of three DVDs of data, three movies, moving into the processor from the network and moving into the processor from the storage every single second. That means 24 hours of compressed video every second for full length DVDs. Now, parallel databases are multi-node systems that work in parallel. What that means is our database to keep up every single second has to be able to process a month's worth of compressed movies. This is a non-trivial problem to solve. There are enemies of this processing rate in the modern software stack. The friendly penguin, Linux, can't keep up with these processing rates. The operating system can't go that fast. The TCP IP networking stack can't go that fast. The file system can't go that fast. And hypervisors certainly can't go that fast. OK, so this picture shows what's going on. On the right-hand side is the database. This could be our database or anybody's database. Data comes into the database from the network or the storage. For data that comes in through the network, it has to traverse hundreds of thousands of lines of complex code in the networking stack. That data then has to get copied into user space for the database to be able to use it, which is very expensive. Data from storage traverses the block layer in the kernel, which is hundreds of thousands of lines of code. The file system, which is tens of thousands of lines of code, before it ends up in the database. So all of this introduces inefficiency in the processing stack. Things can't possibly keep up. So what we've done at Yellowbrick is we've developed a new architecture called our adaptive cut through architecture that cuts through all of that code quite literally. And it's adaptive because it sees what's there. What does the hardware instance I'm running on support, whether that's in the cloud or on premises, doesn't matter. It will check, do I have a high speed network fabric or a regular network? What protocols do I support? Do I have instances with FPGAs I can make use of to run scan accelerators on? Do I have NVMe storage or just regular vanilla storage? Do I need to deal with non-uniform memory, which is an issue in modern processors? The database will then choose the most adaptive way to get data in through the network into itself, in through storage into itself, bypassing as many layers as it possibly can. So this deals with how to move data into the database at line rates. The next question is, how do we process that data? This gets more complicated. Looking back again through that 10-year period, we see a typical CPU has grown in computational throughput from just six cores back in 2010 
to 64 cores today, over a tenfold improvement in throughput. But the number of memory channels we have available, which is about memory bandwidth, how fast can we crunch that data? Memory channels is around how fast can we do random accesses when we join data and aggregate data and uh, sort data. Um, that has only increased two and a half times in the last decade. So there's a pretty big gap here at the end of the day. If we can shift around 40 gigabytes a second of data, and we compress data because we don't want data to waste space, de decompress, that works out over 100 gigabytes a second that we have to move. But if our memory can only do 200 gigabytes a second, by the time we've put that data into the memory and moved it back out again, we still actually haven't processed anything. All we've done is move data around without processing it. So this represents a really complicated architecture's problem to solve. The reality is memory is the new disk. If we look at this table, it shows the speeds of different types of memory in the server. L1 cache is phenomenally fast. It can move data at 12 terabytes a second in aggregates across all of the cores. L2 cache, six terabytes a second. L3 cache, a little variable, but of the order of a couple of terabytes a second. Our main memory, only 200 gigabytes a second. So in order to go fast, the most important thing is we actually can't use main memory to do this data processing to store the data or retrieve the data. It's actually worse than that, and it's a double penalty because working with things in main memory actually messes up the caches, which are the places where things run fast. So in order to make things run fast, we have to process data from cache, not main memory. That means writing code that works with kilobytes of data, not gigabytes of data, almost like going back and programming for a 16-bit computer. We have to write code that avoids main memory for all data movement and all data processing at all costs. We've done that at Yellow Brick as well, but that changes a number of underlying assumptions in the database. We're going to revisit some of them. These won't be common knowledge, but if you think about it in the context of what we've just said, they make perfect sense. An outdated assumption is that databases should cache data in a buffer cache in memory to avoid reading too much from disk. This no longer makes sense. The effective bandwidth of reading data from storage can be the same as from main memory, and for the reasons we talked about, we can't have data going in and out of main memory. An outdated assumption is that CPUs can copy memory far faster than they can move it from the storage or the network. That's also not the case. Moving data across the network with specialist network adapters can be less resource intensive than copying it to and from main memory now, as well as not messing up CPUs caches. An outdated assumption is that keeping more data in memory is the way to better performance. Not true. As we've talked about, our CPU can run 10 times faster if it's processing data from caches. The challenge, of course, is to keep things there, which touches on concurrency, scheduling, workload management, all sorts of other topics that we cover in our technical white papers. Another outdated assumption is that Linux provides great services for high-performance networking. That's not true. The built-in networking is now 20 times less efficient than doing creative alternatives you can read about in our white papers. Another assumption is that Linux provides excellent services for high bandwidth storage. Also not true. Building in your own storage IO stack and file systems can be 100 times more efficient than what Linux provides you now. Now the question is, given all of these outdated assumptions we've talked about, all of which we've addressed and fixed at Yellowbrick, what does that mean in reality? So we thought we'd actually share with you some numbers. These numbers come from one of our customers that recently did testing comparing Yellowbrick to a very well-known leading cloud-only data warehouse. You can see massive benefits in performance and price and the economics of data warehousing. Yellowbrick on 16 nodes can support 10 times the number of users for a given response time of the competitive database running on 32 nodes. Where we end up with at the end of the day is one fifth of the cost per query for that user running on Yellowbrick to meet their goals and response times. It's a phenomenal improvement as a result of revisiting all of these outdated assumptions. Another thing the customer noticed as a result of this competitive testing was that Yellowbrick was able to get the most recent data into the hands of their users much, much, much faster. This customer deals with streaming data, tens to hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. Data recency is very, very important to them. As data flows in from Kafka, 
it gets merged in an incremental ELT process and presented to users for analytics. Yellowbrick was able to do this process in seconds rather than the minutes that the competitive database took. Why is this? We found this a repeating theme. There is a need for real-time data now, and traditionally databases haven't done real-time data and big data at the same time very, very well. We have manufacturing customers analyzing test data from production lines in factories where you care about what happens right now. We have payment processors and digital security customers reducing fraud that requires analytics to always be working with the most up-to-date data. Historically, you've had to deal with two classes of databases or systems to do this. You have databases that do real-time data well. They work on small data sets. They're typically row-oriented. They're often OLTP. They have high-speed transaction logs, or our customers have had to resort to buying specialist streaming SQL engines in the past. You've had databases that do big data well. They are column-oriented. They do bulk loads. But in trying to get them to work with more recent data, you'll hear phrases in the pitch from those vendors, like talking about forcing you to do micro-batching and having to aggregate your data. Products that combine these two traits have generally been niche products, special purpose, not general, horizontal, trustworthy, high quality, high quality of service databases with workload management and high availability and fault tolerance and everything else. So why run two databases or two SQL engines when one will do the job? At Yellowbrick, we've solved this problem. Our storage engine internally has two data stores. We have a row store that scale up, optimized for commit latency, for real-time trickle inserts from SQL, data streaming in from Kafka, data streaming in through CDC from OLTP databases using tools like Golden Gate or HVR. That row store, when the data gets to a sufficient size, the data automatically gets moved to our column store, which is scale out, optimized for throughput, compresses data aggressively, auto indexes, auto sorts, clusters, supports partitioning, and is protected by erasure codes. Tons of cool technology there. These two stores are both unified with consistent ACID transaction semantics across both. They commit, they roll back just, you like, just like you would expect. So at the end of the day, real-time data is immediately queryable alongside data at rest. You have one database, not two. You don't need SQL streaming engines. You don't need inflexible in-memory databases. You can have the economics of big data combined with real-time speed and streaming all in one data warehouse. But that data warehouse doesn't have to be centralized. Our friends at Gartner agree with us. They said over half of enterprise-generated data will be produced and processed outside traditional data centers or a centralized cloud by 2022, compared to just 10% today. By the year 2025, that number will climb as high as 90%. So, Today, a number of our customers deal with this. Our manufacturing customers deal with data made at the edge in factories. Our hospitality customers are dealing with data sovereignty concerns and regulations. That means their data sets can't be exported beyond their territory. Our insurance customers are dealing with vehicles enabled with telematics. Our telco customers are dealing with the exponential data growth enabled by 5G networks. Our vision is to bring the analytics to the data rather than the data to the analytics. Analytics at the network edge, like in factories. Analytics software as a service in multiple public clouds. Analytic platform as a service in customers' private cloud VPCs. And of course, in on-premises data centers and colo facilities as well. So stay tuned for some really cool technology previews that we'll be putting out very, very soon, alongside today's announcement of Yellowbrick for distributed clouds. So to summarize, we've covered today the need for speed, the need for real-time data, and talked a little bit about data warehousing in distributed clouds. I wanted to just thank everybody for listening, including our brilliant customers. Thank you for coming today. I encourage everyone to stay tuned into our summit to hear even more exciting stuff.